and have an opener at this time. We're doing just a short theme here, being that just in a couple of weeks, we're celebrating our 22nd year anniversary, and we're doing a little theme called Pressing On, and we're going to open with Higher Ground. your hymn book. We'll have Brother Lonnie come and he'll lead us this morning. God bless you. Good to see you in church. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to see everyone. If you would grab that hymn book and stand with me if you're able. We're going to make that joyful noise on page number 164. Join me to sing unto him. Praise him. Praise him. You'll be found on page number 164. Starting on that first one. Praise him. Praise him. Page number 164. Praise him. Praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, sing the words His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, hearts of angels and glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children, in His arms He carries
if you would, turn on over there to page number 236. Page number 236, join me there to No Not One, page number 236, starting on that first one, page number 236, No Not One. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. have a friend like Jesus. If you would, just turn around there. We're going to have the piano play through there. Greet your neighbor and say hi to each other. this morning. You may be seated.
have Brother Bill come, and he is going to share some upcoming announcements. I'll take this time again to welcome each and every one of you, all of our visitors and family members here at church. The uh, first thing we have is the uh, cookout again today. It's out here in the uh, pavilion uh, right after the service. And then again on uh, July the 28th, we want to continue to remember that day. That's our 22nd year of being a church here. And uh, we want to continue to ask God to bless us in this ministry and as a lighthouse to this community and the tri-state area. And then we are still uh, looking forward to uh, paying off the note that day also, so just be in prayer for that. And then, uh, on men on the August the 3rd at 8 o'clock, the men's uh, prayer meeting and breakfast. I want to continue to ask you to mark your calendars for that and come out and and join us for that. It's a, it's a good time of devotion and uh, prayer time, and then get to eat after that. August the 2nd, it's a Friday evening, 5 to 8. Uh, we are going to have a, a one-night vacation Bible school. Uh, we're looking for workers and uh, try to invite as many kids as you can. They're going to have teaching, there's going to be fun, and there's going to be food at that and then our missionary of the week is Brother David Elliott. He's a missionary to uh, Canada. I want to continue to remember him and all of our missionaries out there. And the ministry of the week is our nurse nursery. So we want to continue to uh, pray for workers for that. Uh, again, we want, want to be able to have the people come and bring their kids and drop them off and be able to enjoy the service. And... Uh, they are our future of our church, so we want them in the church just as much as, as the adults. So, again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Brother Bill. And I want to just, again, elaborate a little bit on the 28th. Uh, we're praying that the Lord would encourage us, and all we've been doing is just asking you to pray and ask God what will He have you to give, and just be diligent about that. We'd like to pay our note off. Uh, around 230,000, give or take. It just depends on what we have coming in. And of course, in every week, we, do, we have been having money come in on a, just about a weekly basis that's been marked. And uh, they're, the men are putting that to the side. But let's pray about that and just take it to the Lord in prayer and let's all do our part and the Lord will take care of it. Amen, he always does. And let me just, uh, just make a mention on something that was on my heart yesterday. Of course, most of us have heard what has happened to uh, the president, the running president, President Trump, yesterday at a rally. And, uh, you know, this is what the world's kind of coming to. This isn't nothing new to us. I mean, Ronald Reagan was a great man, I felt. And Ronald Reagan, they tried to assassinate him. Uh, they tried to assassinate, and they did, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and, you know, this is something that we, you know, we see from time to time. But I'm going to tell you something that the Lord pressed upon my heart about importance of this. Uh, we're also living in a time when the local New Testament church, I think it really, let me just say it like this. Uh, people of God need to bond together in the local New Testament church. If there's ever been a time where God's, and I, and I say that to say this, some people don't care about church at all. They just pop in one and pop in another one. And pop, they have no perspective of what a church family is. They have no perspective of the importance of a church family, of people being there for one another, working with one another, bearing one another's burdens. And if there's ever a time that we as people need to stick close together, it's always been the principle. Because Paul says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But the day we're living in is not only crumbling up there, but we're seeing so much of it in a spiritual sphere to where the world is looking at the church like, I don't need what you got to offer. I don't need what you got to offer. I'm better off the way I am. And we want that not to be the case with us. So I would just encourage you, pray for one another, stay close to the things that you know are right. Because as the Bible tells us, as the time goes on, ladies and gentlemen, things aren't going to get better. They are not going to get better. And I'm going to tell you, the more we get towards the end of this thing, the more you need Christ and you need Christ-like people around you on a daily basis. And I'm just, I'm just tell, giving you some advice that God's laid on my heart. You can do whatever you want with it, but I'm just telling you it's very important for us to have the right kind of people around us, the right kind of um, uh, a commitment and doing the right type of things in these last days we're looking at. And I would just encourage the church, keep doing what you're doing because you're doing what's right biblically. 
And nobody can refute that, and God blesses that. So just stay focused on what you're doing and keep it up, all right? Brother Marvin, why don't you lead the men this morning, and we'll go ahead and take up an offering. I was actually looking for my notes on that. I did have them here, but... So, you know, as a couple weeks ago, we were right at around $130,820.47 in our savings. Uh, We're right now around $34,000 in our checking. The balance on the loan is $388,902. Um, we take 100 out of that out of our checking account, savings account, which would drop that loan total to $288,902.90. Maybe we could knock a little bit more off. I don't know. But that $288,000, $289,000 is what we're praying about. And I tell you, God does it all the time. Amen? He does it all the time. So it ain't about money. I mean, this church doesn't, we don't, we don't teach sow $10 and reap 1000 We don't teach that nonsense. We don't teach that. We don't give to reap. We give because God tells us to give. Amen. We, we give because the Lord wants us to give and we're stewards. And so I would just encourage you again to have your part in that. And I think the Lord will take care of it and we'll see what he does. Good to see Brother Rodney today. Brother Marvin. Come on up, Brother Marvin. Brother Kevin and Brother Scott. We'll have Brother Marvin pray for the offering. And don't forget, right after services, you can make your way out the side door. The all good steak grilled hamburgers. And I mean that. These are good steak burgers, uh, hot dogs. And then next week, we don't have anything planned. But the following week is our 28th anniversary. We're going to take up an offering. We've got a pig that's being cooked. We're going to have pulled pork. It's going to be a good time under the evangelist Frank. Stewart Pavilion, and we're going to just look for a time of celebration. So, Brother Marvin, pray for us, please. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we had to be in your house, Lord. We just pray that you be this offering. We take it up, Lord, and pray that you bless the gift and the giver, Lord. And you've certainly been so good to us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to give back to you what is rightfully yours, Lord. Father, you own everything, Father, and help us, Lord, just to be pleasing to you as stewards. Father, and just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you, Father, for us looking, being here and looking forward to the preaching of your word. Pray that you be the pastor who brings forth the message. Father, that you would open your word, that we, our hearts would be open, Lord, to receive it. Touch us by this Holy Spirit, Lord, and pray if someone's here lost, they need Christ, they'd be saved today. And we do pray for our country, our leaders, and yes. Father, bless them and help us to keep uh, seeking you and to serving you. And Lord, pray for their salvation. Father, have you well and way, Lord, and just pray that you would continue to be with our church. It may grow, Lord, to be exactly who you want us to be, Father, help us to be pleasing to you. and. Father, just bless the services and singing. Lord, just have you well and way that you receive all the glory and the honor, Father, in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen.
preaching this morning is going to be found in the book of Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter number three. We're going to have the ladies sing for us right before the message. This is a great song. I got to thinking they don't sing it enough. They sing it right around Christmas time. And of course, it's very appropriate for Christmas, but it's just a great song that deals with the doctrine of what we would call Christology. So you listen to the song and we're going to get into Philippians chapter number three today. that's what I live for. I live to see him and meet him and greet him in the right manner. That's what it's all about. Thank you ladies for encouraging us in that great truth. Let me just say choir practice tonight will be at six o'clock. So six o'clock everybody who's involved in working on music will meet tonight then we're going to have a little bit of an afternoon so get you home and maybe get you a little bit of a rest and we'll meet at six o'clock and tonight um, you know, for the last two Sunday nights, we've been looking into the life of Samson, and uh, it's really, it's really been a blessing. And I'm going to finish it tonight, and uh, it's been a, been a, some, some good learning, I hope, and um, encouragement in the faith. Philippians chapter three. I mentioned last week we're just going to preach 
just a couple messages out of this particular uh, chapter because it is dealing with our anniversary and we are calling this particular short sermon series Pressing On, Pressing On. Philippians chapter three, if you're able, stand with me as we read the word of God. If not, just remain seated. I'm gonna read to verse number 14. Last week we started in verse number one and we preached verse one, two, and three. And today we're gonna pick up in verse number four. Verse number four of Philippians chapter three. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, that if I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's read together verse number 14 in unison and we will start now. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Our small sermon series is titled Pressing On. Now today, I wanna just perhaps with the title ask the question, what do you think about the high calling of God in your life? Is it a high call? And let's ask the Lord to help us with this particular thought. Lord, we praise you and thank you, and we give you honor and glory for all things. To say you are magnificent is the understatement of the world. You are far above and beyond all that we could comprehend and imagine. We thank thee for revealing thyself through thy son, Jesus Christ, and through thy holy word. And we pray today that the Holy Ghost will bless the preaching of the word to edify the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Now, I, I want us to take a look at something here, starting in verse number 10, and I want us to look at some, some, some well, letters, but these letters are referring to words. Verse number 10, I have in my Bible that I, and I have I underlined, that I. And then if you go down to verse 11, it says, if by any means I, I have that I again underlined. And Paul is talking about his personal life. In verse number 12 again, it says, but I, and I have that underlined, follow after, if that I, I have that underlined, may ap that if I may apprehend for that which also I, I have that underlined, down to verse 13, he says, brethren, I, I have that underlined, and then he says, I do. That is forgetting those things which are behind. And verse 14, he says, I. So you hear Paul giving us his personal testimony. I may know him. I haven't attained. I follow after. That I may apprehend. That I may and am apprehended. I 
count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I press, verse 14, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, very interesting, he's bringing me and you into this. Because in verse 14, of 15 and verse 16, he says, let us. So he's bringing me and you into the lifestyle that he was living. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. So he's encouraging us to follow and mark his example. And then he says that again in verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. So here Paul is referring to his life, which was a spirit-filled, God-blessed life. And he's encouraging us in what he's doing in his ministry to finish well. And then he encourages me and you to think about the same with the word us. Now, we talked last week when it comes to pressing on towards the Lord's work. And, you know, we're all pressing on towards the end. Let's just be honest. We're, we're not going to get any younger while we're here. We're not going to get any... Um, any more opportunities than what the Lord has given us today or, you know, the next month or two years or five years or 30 years. I don't know. But I'm just saying we're all pressing on. And in order to press on properly, there's got to be from you a personal determination. You, and that's what Paul is saying here. I press toward. There's got to be a personal determination on your part. I mean, you've got to commit, ladies and gentlemen. Our culture today is committed to nothing. Our culture today is not determined to really do anything except what pleases them. That's the culture we live in today. If it pleases them and it goes well with them, well, they're on board and they're your best friend. But man, if it doesn't please them or have something to give them, you know, they're going to seek. And many people send their whole life on this seeking journey. Their whole life. So there needs to be a personal determination. But, and with personal determination, you've got to have a goal. You've got to have a goal. And Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize. So Paul had a goal, a mark, a prize. And obviously we know his mark and prize and goal was Jesus Christ. And there must be in your life, you must have some goals. You must apply your life to something. If you don't have any goals in life, then you're not going to find any fulfillment with certain areas of your life for God. Now you may be good at certain things, but does it honor God? And does it magnify God? So there needs to be in our life as a church, as we're going to press on here towards our 22nd year anniversary, and if the Lord tarries another 70 years, we've got to be thinking about the next future, the next generation. We'd be thinking about our children, our grandchildren. They need to see Christ living through us. And they need to know that we are people. Like the last couple generations, the last couple generations of people, they, my generation previous and the previous generation before them and onward, previous speaking that is, these were people that had determination. They would work with a broken hand. I mean, if their leg was broke, they'd go to work on Monday morning. These people had determination. If the crops needed to be brought in and they couldn't hardly walk, they would get out there and do all they could to get the job done. They were determined. They had a goal. Their goal was to, to, to be the best they could be with who they are and take care of that which God had trusted through their life, their family. They had a goal. And then there's always personal fulfillment when such a life is structured. There is a fulfillment sooner or later. Um, you know, in this world, we don't look for much fulfillment here. I mean, we're here to minister. We're pilgrims here. My fulfillment is up there. My fulfillment is up there. And, 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 and the fullness of what I'm laboring about, although there's glimpses of it here, but there, there needs to be a personal fulfillment. And Paul's personal fulfillment was no doubt to reach the lost. And his personal fulfillment was this, to finish faithfully. To finish faithfully. And did he finish faithfully? He did finish faithfully. He did. And so last week we learned there's three things or three at least principles that we're going to need in our life to press on. Number one, we're just going to need to honor God's goodness and, and be happy in Christ. As Christians, you know, look, sometimes you complain too much, man. Take that elsewhere. You complain too much. What are you still complaining about? And putting this down and putting that down and whining and complaining and I'm not being critical, but... 
we live in a complaining type culture today. I mean, you got, you're, you're blessed more than you and my, we're blessed probably more than we deserve. But we complain a lot. If this don't go right, we're complaining. If that ain't right, we're whining. If that ain't right, we're complaining. And if that ain't good, we're complaining. And if that ain't right, we're What is wrong with us? That ain't pressing toward the mark, friend. That's harming other people and deteriorating yourself. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, we talked last week that it's going to take the scripture. Because Paul says, if we're going to press on, I mean, don't get me wrong. I deal with heartache and headache every day. But you don't hear me talking to you about it, do you? There ain't a person in this room that's ever heard me talk about heartache and headache and wishing ill against somebody. There's not a person living in this room that's ever heard that from me. Although I could say that, but that's not what I want to be focused on, amen? And I don't want that, and you don't want that. And then, so, we talked about just relaxing and enjoying the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of God. I'm praising his name for it. And I told you, as long as your mind is set on giving God honor and giving God glory, and as long as your mind is set on praising God, well, your mind can't be thinking about any ill thing or any problems if your mind is set over here. Your mind can't take a bad thought and a good thought and deal with them both at the same time. You can't live like that. Nobody's mind operates like that. So we talked about, secondly, if we're going to pre- first of all, if we're going to press on, we're going to have to have the right kind of mind of praising God. And Paul says, as he opens here, rejoice in the Lord. He also says this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Christian, rejoice, will you? Will you get happy about your Christian life? Now, I got to say this. If you're not saved and you think you're saved, then you're a most miserable person. If you're here today and you think you're saved and you don't know Jesus Christ, I get it then. You're miserable. But you don't need to stay like that. You Listen, you don't need to stay like that. God loves you and God cares for you. And God will help us with that. And then secondly, we talked about if we're going to press on, we're going to need to stay to the word. He says to write the same things unto you again to me. It's not grievous, but to you it's safe. And remember last week what we talked about? The safest place for you to be at in your life is in the Word of God on a daily basis. Now I'm going to tell you something. You trust me right there and listen to what I tell you there. The safest place for you to be in your marriage, in your stewardship, in your life is in the Word of God. That's the safest place. God's Word will never tell you what to do in the sense of that which is ill or wrong. And we talked about staying in the Word. And then we also talked about be wary. And I, 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 I kind of feel that there's just a handful of people on the earth nowadays. It's not that we want to get carried away with it. But you know, in the Bible, in the old times, in the sense of the Old Testament, when the false prophets came around, friend, they said, you're wrong. That ain't what God says. Get out of here with that stuff. And nowadays, today, people embrace that wrong stuff. And because there's no meaning, not to me, oh, well, that preacher's so narrow-minded. All he wants to do is put people down. I ain't got it no right to put anybody down but if it don't line up with that book friend then I've got a voice in it and that argument isn't with me it's with God well that's just the way you would interpret it the Bible interpretation is not hard it's not hard don't don't go there it's not hard this interpretation this book is easy okay this is wrote on a fourth grade level of learning so there isn't no secret high things in the Word of God it's easy to learn now I'm just saying, Paul said to his people that day, you beware of dogs. You beware of evil workers. You beware of them of the, well, let me read you what he says. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Now, dogs were people who would, uh, uh, and and that would make you sick, you know, give give you a bad attitude or give you a bad mindset. You get around the wrong person. They start talking bad about somebody. Before you know it, you're talking bad about them, ain't you? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a dog. They got worms, they're called spiritual worms. You spend enough time with them, you, th- them worms that they got in their belly will be in your belly. Are you following me here? And then he said evil workers. And then he mentions the concision, which would basically be Jewish people. Okay, and then he said, make sure you're saved because we are those who are of the circumcision, not made with hands, being saved. Okay, so we got this. So three principles about pressing on as a church. 
for the next generation. Number one, we're, we're just going to have to be happy in the Lord and thank God for his goodness. And number two, we're going to have to stick close to the word of God because it's our safe haven. Number three, every now and then we're going to have to beware. And, you know, we're going to have to watch certain things and just be cautious. As Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. That's all. And then we're going to have to make sure we're saved. Now, today... We're, we're going to continue to, to press on about this. And, uh, you know, God's got some goals with his local New Testament church, which involves your life. God's got some goals. And, and, and God's got a goal for my life. God revealed, and, and he does this with all of us, I'm not alone here. God revealed his goal for me by what we call his perfect will. So I know what God wants with my life. I, I know what he wants. I, I know what he wants me to do. I'm, I'm, I understand that. And, and here now we move into a little bit of a different thought here. Same, same precept about pressing forward. But how are we going to press on properly and biblically? First of all, let me ask the question. What do you think your life's greatest gain is? Now, automatically, as a Christian, we want to say Jesus, but I want you to stop for a moment. And I do agree with you there. I agree with you. But what is life's greatest gain to you? What is life's greatest gain? Verse 4 through 6, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But verse 7, but what things were gained to me? I want to stop. What is your prize for gain? What is it that makes you your last and first name? What is it that gives you your testimony to other people to know who you are, not who you think you are, what other people know you to be. Where is life's gain at? How can you gain? What does this word even mean, gain? Well, let me give you an, a biblical definition. I always, I think we should always look for a biblical definition and then of course go to Noah Webster if there's any type of confusion, just for some clarity sakes. But here, here listen, listen, to, listen to the definition of gain. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall man give in exchange for his soul? I'm going to read it again. What does gain mean? For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall man give in exchange for his soul? What does gain mean? First of all, it means profit. Profit. Um, over here, Brother Mark, is profit. Over here is profit. Hold on. How can there be profit over here and profit over here? Well, here, watch. This profit is what we would call unwise. This profit is called wise. This one here can gain in my life where that one there takes away from my life. Although it seems like it's gaining. The people who put things in their body, they think they're gaining a high. But in reality, they're losing themselves. Nothing's different in any area of life right there. It just may not be a narcotic, but nothing's different there in the sense of how that works. So the word gain means profit or profited. And that can be a wise profit or an unwise profit. It also means possessed because he says here, what shall man give in exchange for his soul? What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world? Possess. What, you know, there are things I need to possess that are wise gain. And, and in honesty, there are things in my life, in my heart that are unwise. And look, I do not need to possess them. I do not need to possess certain things. And especially when it comes to the heart because they affect our total being because the Bible says as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So there are certain things that I try to line my heart up and say, you go back. But you know what I found on them things like that? About an hour later, who is that again? Oh, it's me again. Can I come in? I told you to get. 
And here he is again. And sometimes, sadly enough, this goes on for years in a person's life. Years. And it's unwise. It's a prophet, but boy, it's an unwise prophet. And it means possession, possess. And when we think about possess, get or loose. And then it's also, gain deals with perception. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? It deals with perception. What do you see, let me come back to the question, what do you see and I see in your life that brings gain into you? Where is your gain really at? Well, as we look into what Paul says here, is it an accomplishment? Because he does say, if any man, back to our text, if any man thinks that he can have confidence in the flesh, Paul says, me more. So is gain for you in your flesh? Is it, is, it, is it in your person? Is gain, is gain, is profit, is possession in your life? Is it from your accomplishments? You know, I was with Brother Mark yesterday for a little bit of a morning and a gentleman passed me and I said, how's it going today? He says, good. I said, how's God treating you? Real quick, uh, I don't believe in God. I said, sir, you're missing out big time. He says, that depends on who you're asked. I said, no, you're missing out. And he went on, I went on. His gains and my gains, oh, no, no, we on, we're not on the same page here, friend. We're not on the same page. Now, I at one time was there, because you know what? At one time, I thought my gain was there being on a Saturday morning, getting double time, like some of us. We think gain can be in personal accomplishments. And there's nothing wrong with accomplishing. Fact of the matter is, whatever your hand is put toward, do it with all your might. If you're a mechanic, do it. Uh, if you, you know, design things, do it all. I mean, just give it all you got. Okay, but, but is that your real gain? Uh, Paul says, if any man have confidence in the flesh, I more. And then Paul, as you know, says in Romans chapter 7, I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So I got to look at all this and say, now Paul is saying uh, that if any man has confidence in the flesh, he has confidence in the flesh more. But then Paul tells me over here that he has no confidence at all in the flesh. What's he saying? Well, he's saying exactly what he had said in Galatians 2.20. For me to live, or Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So I put that together and I say, oh, Paul's saying that he let Christ in charge of his life. And then Galatians 2.20 says, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I can understand where he's at here. He is telling me that gain is not in the flesh. Secondly, well, what about heritage? I mean, some of us, uh, there's no doubt, your parents were multi-billionaires and you come from a rich background. Your dad was well-known, your mom was well-known perhaps, people in your life are well-known in the community. There's, that's wonderful. By the way, that's wonderful. But Paul says here, uh, if any man have any confidence in the flesh, I more. I, be, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And what Paul is saying is he had an incredible background. He really did. He followed, his parents followed the Mosaic law to the exact T. I mean, in his particular life, his heritage, he was of an, uh, an Israelite, he was particularly of the tribe of Benjamin, and he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and he was a Pharisee. Paul had a great lineage. Uh, and you know, it don't mean much to us, but the Jewish people and the Jewish culture was so strong about their heritage that if their children and their family members got off the Jewish faith, you do know what they would do. If they were conservative Jews, do you know what they would do? They would put in a paper that their son or their daughter had died. Then they would have a casket up here and they would say they're in it. We know them no more. They would take them away from all the family. They would disown them and they would completely be done with them. So their heritage was very important. And by the way, Christian heritage is extremely important. All right, so it's, is it an heritage? What about things? As a Hebrew of the Hebrews, did Paul have power? Oh, he had power. He had wills. He, he, I mean, he had things he could get done. I mean, when he heard Stephen preaching, he said, you know what? To this guy, kill him. The guy said, you got it. Man, that's a lot of power. And they stoned Stephen to death. And when they got done, Paul's looking on it. And they take off their jackets and they drop them at his feet saying, anybody asks who we did this, you're the one that's accountable. You gave us the permission. Here's our witness against you with our jackets. He had power, friend. This is a no-nonsense guy. 
This was a, you know, you, look, you don't think like this, and I don't think like this all the time, but you, you, no wonder this man wrote most of the New Testament. This is a serious individual. This isn't somebody who came out of a field who didn't know anything about life. This was one of the most educated, one of the most prominent, one of the most dedicated men walking the earth in his day and age. And God used him to write most of the New Testament. But what about things? No. Jesus said that you and me need to beware of things. We need to beware of covetous because a man's life consisteth not in the things or the abundance of things in which he has. Well, here, he mentions another one. What about religion? What about religion? Because he does mention here that he was a Pharisee. Now, Pharisees, can I just remind us, ladies and gentlemen, they went to church Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Every one of them gave a tenth at least. They fasted once a day, once a week, or twice a week. They prayer meeting once or twice a week. I mean, the Pharisees out would outdo them. They'd run circles around me and you. They'd run circles around our Christian, so-called Christian walk. But you know what they were doing? It was all religion. They had no relationship. It was all religion. Is gain in religion? Well, I mean, you know, when you go to see Mr. Law, Mr. Law says, what's the problem? And you say, well, I'm not feeling well. And Mr. Law says, well, you know, you got to get some activity in your life. I'm going to send you down here and prayer. I'm going to prescribe you Mr. Friday night activity. Go see him. And he goes down and sees Mr. Friday night activity and Mr. Friday activity doesn't work out right. And then he goes back to Mr. Law and Mr. Law says, how, how are you feeling? Oh, no good. I tried them activities. I was up all night and I got sick the next morning. I had a bad headache from all that stuff they gave me. And he says, oh, well, that may not fit out for you. That may not just work out for you. Let's, uh, let me, I'm going to send you down to Mr. Do Good. Here, I'm going to write you out a prescription for Mr. Do Good. And you go spend some time with Mr. Do Good. And he left and took the prescription of Dr. Law with Mr. Do Good. And he tried to do good and came back to the doctor. And the doctor says, what are you back here so quick for? He goes, well, it ain't working. What do you mean you can't do right? He goes, I learned real quick I can't do right. Mr. Mr. Do Good's not working good for me. Oh, okay, well, you, oh, you're one of them type. You need religion. Here, let me write you out a prescription for Mr. Religion. Go down there and do what Mr. Religion says. And he goes down there and does what Mr. Religion says. Do this, do that, do this, do that, and do all them things. And he found himself in just a more miserable way. And he went back to the doctor and he says, Doctor, none of this stuff is helping. And, um, you know, and, and it's just not working. And he said, well, try this. And he came back and try this and he came back. And then he's telling one of his friends, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I am most miserable in life. I can't accomplish anything in the flesh that's amounting to anything. I have no happiness. I have no desire. I, I've tried Mr. Religion. I've tried Mr. Entertainment. I've tried Mr. This. I've tried Mr. That. I don't know what I'm going to do. And his friend says, hey, there's somebody called Mr. Grace. Have you went and talked to him? No, I've never talked to Mr. Grace. And he went down to Mr. Grace, and Mr. Grace told him what he needed to do. He says, you need to repent of your sin. You get your life right with God. You need to turn, some of the stuff that you're doing here is bad for you. That prescription you got from Dr. Law is ruining you, son. You're sickly looking. How long have you been like this? And he said, well, what do I need to do? And he says, you need to, you need to give your life to God. And he goes, oh, I can't do that. I don't know what else to tell you. Well, I appreciate your time and your appointment. I'll see you later. He goes, yeah, I will, because I see them all later. They all come back to me sooner or later. I will see you later. And as years went by, he came back to Mr. Grace, and he said he had a heart problem, you know. He says, we got to do surgery. He goes, when? He goes, right now. He goes, what? Right now. <laughs> it's an old thought. <laughs> And there Jesus lays on the table and gives his life for the man. Gives him that heart that makes him a new creature in Christ. It wasn't in accomplishments. It's not in heritage. Your gain in life, your greatest gain is not in religion. You say, but I'm zealous. You're zealous for what? What are you zealous for? Paul says here in verse 6 concerning zeal, I persecute the church. What? Are you, what, what? And, and then look, what about character? You say, well, I'm a good man. I don't curse, I don't swear, I don't do this, I don't do that. But what about character? What's he say about character? Well, he says in verse number six, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. You know what Paul says about all this stuff? 
He says it's not even to be compared to is cow manure. Do you understand that, ladies and gentlemen? He said, but what things I thought were gain to me, those I counted loss. And there may be some of us here today, you think gains in these things. And how long have you been searching, I've asked. How long have you been looking? And how long and how many times have you come up empty-handed without the answer? Now, to learn where and what real gain is in life, it takes you being honest with yourself before God. Not me. I'm not in this picture. But you've got to be honest with yourself before God. If you've got pride, this would be the time to push it away and say, I, I don't need you right now in my life. And I'm just saying, Paul goes on here and he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. See, law couldn't do it. Law said, go see this one, go see this one, do this, do that, do this, do that. Law couldn't do it. Which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God. Can I just say something about you? You know deep, deep, deep down in your heart what you are. I don't. But friends, you do. And if you're not willing to get honest with who you are, I really wouldn't know how to help you. But you sitting here this morning and me standing here this morning, we know deep, deep, deep who we are. We know who we are. Now, we must be honest with ourself. He says this, and not with only ourself, because you know you, you know what you think is gain, but you need to be honest with yourself and God. To learn where life's real gain is, it takes reflection and honesty with yourself. You look at yourself. Ask yourself some personal questions. Do a self-interview. Do a personal interview. Then take yourself in that interview and come over here with God. And spend some time over here. And see if there's a difference here of gain. See if there's a difference of gain. Where is your life's greatest gain at? Well, Paul says, number one, it starts with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse eight, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Great gain in life starts with you knowing who Jesus Christ is. And by the way, who he isn't too. Because we got a lot of messed up stuff about who he is today. He is not the, the brother of Lucifer. He is not Satan's brother, friend. He is not a mere man that walked on this earth. He is not a prophet like so many would teach us. I mean, so much confusion about who Christ is. Who is Christ? I'm going to tell you who Jesus Christ is. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Before there was anything or anybody with anything in any circumstance, there is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Almighty. And without Him was not anything made that is made. And by Him, all things consist. He is the perfect Son of God who shed His sinless blood on Calvary's cross, who died in the death of a sinner, was buried on the third day. He bodily rose again, spent 40 days with his disciples. He ascended back up into heaven. He gives eternal life for those who are serious about their life. Those who are serious about Jesus Christ. Not some kind of religious show. I'm not talking about that kind of nonsense we got going on today. The church house is not a house of people entertainment, friend. We're not up here to see who can get the best award for singing. We're not up here to see who can get the best award for giving some kind of clap show. We're not into that here. We're into honoring and glorifying the one who holds our life in his hand. Amen. He died for you. He was buried. He rose again. He is the Son of God. He has no equal. This is who we're talking about today. It starts here. You know why people don't commit to him? They don't know him. You can maybe have a relationship, profess for 20 years, and you still not know him today. You don't know his power. You don't know his ability. 
You don't know what you're pressing on towards. And I'm here to help you. It starts with a knowledge of Jesus Christ. I tell you, I just, he's been so good to me. I can't get over how good God has been to me. Every time I need Jesus Christ, he has always been there for me. He has never let me down. He has never abandoned me. He has always done above and beyond what I could ever imagine. I love him. I love him. And I understand why Paul gave his life for him. I understand why these men gave their life for him. I slowly start to understand that this life ain't about me. It's about him. And you got to get honest. And I knew one day when I got honest with God, I knew I was in big trouble. Some of us here today, you're leaving the church, going to go out and get in sin, going to go out and do some drinking this week, going to go out and play around in the world, dirty jokes, watch their dirty stuff on there. Who do you think you're fooling, friend? What kind of life you think? Who do you think you're fooling at the end of the day? Who do you think you're fooling? You better straighten up from that kind of stuff. It ain't right. It's your business, but I'm telling you as a pastor that loves you, it ain't right. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm encouraging you what to do. It ain't right. God's awfully good. Jesus Christ, knowing him, when you come to know him, you, need, you got it all. And to know our life's greatest gain is starts with knowing Jesus Christ. It starts with getting honest. He says, I count all things in my life but dung. Are you kidding me, Paul? I am. You mean you count this dung and that dung and all these things you've got throughout these 30 years of your living? You count as nothing? He says, I'm getting rid of all of them. Well, what are you going to do? I'm getting on a boat. And I'm going to tell everybody as much as I can about this great Savior I have. I don't care about these things. And he was a man. He was a man who got honest with himself. And it starts with honesty with self. And it starts with the righteousness of God, which is only found in Jesus Christ. And to receive the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ is eternal gain and eternal profit. And then pressing on, we're going to need to press on. He says here, press on toward the mark. And what does this mean? Pressing on toward the mark. It means knowing Christ personally. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If there's one thing I want in my life, I want to know more of him. I want to know more about him. I want to know what the Bible says. That's why this preacher stays in the book and I stay away from other things. I don't allow myself to be influenced with men who are not in that book all the time. I do not allow it. And the fact of the matter, and I'm not a great preacher, but the fact of the matter is I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know that, Joseph, don't you walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't you sit in the seat of the scornful. Uh, they're going to have a different judgment. I want to know and look at the lives of different men like I'm studying now. I want to go to the book of Proverbs. I want to understand that through desire of a man, having separated himself, intermingled with all wisdom. I want to know what the Bible says, friend. I want to know what the Word of God teaches me. And I want to know Christ personally. I'm not really not at a place where I say, Jesus. If he says, yes, Joseph. I don't get that. And I don't get these people who do get that, but that's not my business. But I tell you why, I know he's there, because his word says, I don't need to ask him where he's at. The word says he's already there. I don't need to say, Jesus, where are you? The Bible tells me he'll never leave me, nor forsake me. So I'm going to trust the book. But I can tell you every time I've called on him, like again, he's been right there. You know... To know Jesus Christ personally, this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Paul talks about the cross. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now watch this. <coughs> being made conformable. Being made conformable unto his death. And this is where most don't want to go. They don't want to go this far with it. Being made conformable unto his death. We're not really interested in presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice on the behalf of other people. Selfish. And Paul is saying that he wanted to be conformable unto his death. He wanted a life that, that reflected Christ. And the cross of Christ was death. He died there. But the death of Christ was purposeful. So is it with us, spiritual development. Paul says, I die daily. I die daily. 
Now, speaking of spiritual development, he says in verse number 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What does the resurrection show? Death, burial, resurrection. What does the resurrection show? Brand new creature, brand new life, brand new individual, new ways, new hobbies, new actions, new heart, new mind. It means a brand new person walking in newness of life. And what Paul is saying, if we're going to press on, we're going to have to press on living in newness of life. How do you know he says that? Well, watch. We're almost finished. We're going to have to press on in newness of life. And, and here, he goes on in verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of in Christ. So here, what Paul is saying is, I'm walking in newness of life, I want to know him, and there's a good work that has begun. In Philippians chapter 1 of this book, verse number 6, Paul boldly and confidently says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So this is something that Paul knew, and a good work has begun. But, but, but when he says here, not that I have apprehended, not that I have apprehended, there's the idea of spiritual maturity here, meaning I don't have all of it together, uh, to a degree is what he's saying, not that I have apprehended, but watch. Either were perfect, but I follow after that I may be apprehended for that which I am also apprehended of Christ. Now here's what Paul is saying. This thought of apprehend, it's got the idea of understood. And Paul is saying this, I don't expect, watch this, I don't expect a lost world to understand why I live the way I live. I don't, but here's what he's saying. I'm going to continue my walk with God, apprehend, I'm going to continue understanding Christ so that sooner or later, those around me will understand me. Today, do we have enough Christianity and Christianity to see in Christ, for Christ to be understood? Do you see what he's saying here? He said, not that I've apprehended, not that I've got it all together, I'm still learning. And by the process of me still learning and growing and, and trying to understand who Christ is will help other people to better understand who Christ is. Or it's like this, Paul's saying this, I need to understand him so that I can be understood or he can be understood through my life. Think about this. And, and this is the kind of witness I tell you that America needs today. This is the kind of biblical witness that America needs. We, look, we just need to get right back to the Bible, friend. We just need to get right back to the Bible. And I'm just saying a good work has begun, and we need to understand Christ in order to be understood or apprehend or apprehended. And I'll tell you another thing he says here if we're going to press on. I said it deals with knowledge of Christ and learning of Christ and being made conformable unto his death, living and walking in newness of life and realizing, I'm, I'm, now tomorrow, I've got some stuff going on tomorrow, but I tell you what, that there is getting in me. I got stuff going on Tuesday, but that ain't getting in the way of it. I got stuff going on Wednesday, that ain't getting, look, that book is number one. So what I'm getting at is I must understand so that you can understood. Okay. And I think that happens more here than you think. Through preaching and teaching, you say, ah, now I understand. I don't think we understand really what he's saying here to the full potential. But sometimes through the preaching of the word of God, you say, oh, now I get it. Yeah, you know why you got it? Because I am not attained and I'm trying to understand so that Christ can be understood with you. And that's how you function and work out there in a world that needs Christ. Make sense? Amen. All right, so I tell you another thing this is going to have to deal with though. A good work's begun in all of you. you, you if you're here today and you're saved, a good work's begun in your life. A good work. Man, this is a good work. All right? You're going to have to deal with your past mistakes and failures. Do you hear what I said? You're going to have to deal with your past mistakes and failure and nail them to the cross and get them out of your backpack. I don't know what may hang you up from last week or last month or last year, but I can tell you one thing. It'll interfere with everything I'm telling you here. You won't agree to it, but I'm telling you it'll hinder everything I'm teaching you this morning. And Paul says, this one thing I do, this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Can I say this? That if we're looking back at the past, and when we look at the past, I want us to realize something. Maybe you don't understand this, but let's try. So when you're looking back, that's a direction you can look. Is it gain? I don't think, I think you know that. Or you can look forward in the direction you're going at. All right, now watch. As a Christian, when you're looking back, not all the time, but nine times out of 10, you're looking at some sort of carnality that's a mess that'll never get resolved as long as you focus on it because it's of the flesh. If you're moving that way and not this way, the old nature wants to go there, but the new nature says this way. Are you, are you following me? This one thing I do. Now this doesn't just mean forgetting the past. You know, Paul said this, you know, he said, um, my hands are clean of all men. I've, you know, he got his life right with the Lord. He might've had some people, I have no doubt that hated him, but you know, Paul didn't have that in his heart. And you know, David made it very clear against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now you may stand up and argue his point, but you ain't gonna go very far because God's gonna tell you, God don't know what you're talking about because it's done. But see how, we, see how we operate here? See how we spend a lot of time over here? And that's why we hindered in this whole thing of pressing forward and we can be a crippling stone if we're not careful as a local New Testament church. I can do that. I, I, I know my potential there to do that. And I don't want to do that. The old nature interferes with the new nature and its divine design. The old nature interferes with the new nature and this good work that's begun in you. Don't let nothing mess with that good work that's begun. Protect that good work. Nourish that good work. Stand up for that good work. Press on. Say for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then lastly, one more thing. We're talking about pressing on. Number one. Number one. We have... <clears throat> we we, we got to understand where life's greatest gain is. We need to be honest with ourselves and with God. We're going to have to press on toward the mark, which is going to require knowing Jesus Christ personally, being conformed unto his cross, living in the newness of the life, understanding a good work has begun, and we need to, uh, we need to develop that. We need to understand that good work to be understood, to be understood. And then lastly, Take serious, take serious the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God comes to you today and he encourages you about salvation. I have no idea with this, I don't. But if God comes to you today and you're here and you're not saved, and God comes to you and speaks to you about being saved, and you say no to him, it could be the last time in your life he ever comes to you and you'll spend eternity in hell separated from him. Look, look, here's what I'm trying to say. Far too many Christians take the high calling of God as no different than a scammer on your phone line. Don't disturb me. You should take serious when God calls your life. You should take this utter, mo it is death and it is life. And Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't play around with the high calling of God. If God's called you to salvation, you got a choice to make there. If God calls you to service, you got a choice to make there. But I would encourage you to be real careful of how you do that. I would encourage you to be real sensitive and diligent on how you respond to the Lord. Because he's only obligated, according to the Bible, to come to us one time. One time. The Bible says many are called, few are chosen. No doubt. No doubt. Few respond. The high calling. If we're going to press on, and Brother Marvin and Brother Kevin and a group of us here, men, if we don't, if we're the only ones who are going to, we're not, we are not. Thank God we got a whole church. But if we're just a couple of us here that are pressing on to the high mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, and uh, no one else is, well, let me just tell you something. I'll probably be going to heaven in a couple, three or four years, maybe 10, I don't know, maybe sooner, maybe later. But I know what to expect. 20 years, I know what to expect. What? Well, Let's see here. Could be a store. Could be a thrift store. Um, 
Yeah, it could be a thrift store. could be somewhere to park cars out. I mean, it's real easy to knock them walls out and clean all this out and park cars in here. And it could be, a, 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 could be a place for storage. Now, you think I'm joking, don't you? <laughs> Friend, I'm not joking at all. You younger people that are sitting here today, you, you keep an eye on what I just said. You may be saying in 25 years from now, pastor said that would happen if we took call, the call of God lightly. I'm going to take my call seriously. And by the way, that's all I can do. What you do with yours, I can advise you on because God advises me, but that's between you and the Lord. But I'm going to take my call serious. I'm going to take it serious. And I encourage you to come along. And as we move into our 22nd year anniversary, if it be the Lord's will, let's press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God calling you today to be saved. Come on. Come on. God calling you today to service. Come on. This is the high calling of God. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity maybe. Let's have our heads bowed please.